Real-time games typically come in one of two categories. You have pattern recognition games along the lines of Spot It, where in this case, you are shown two cards on the table and you must quickly identify an object that is on both of the cards. So you find something, that person claims a card, you turn over another card, probably something different matches now between the two cards, and you continue, and whoever grabs the most cards wins. It's a simple observation and reaction game. Two elements to that, observation, reaction. So you can be good at spotting something, but if you are a slow person, and I've played with people who are like that, then you'll hesitantly or tentatively reach out or casually go like you're getting a sandwich at a deli. No. You can't do that. You guys be grabbing something off the stove before it catches on fire. So pattern recognition games, pattern building games work a bit differently in that you still have the observation. You have to see something and react, but there's a skill to what you're doing. One of the best known examples of this is Ubango by Jigal Schrechtman, uh, published by Cosmos. Uh, 2004, I believe, and sold more than 2 million copies. There's been tons of spinoff of Ubongo, and it works by giving you some geometric shapes. You roll a die, and that die determines which shapes you're going to use to fill the pattern on your card. So the cards are roughly equal in difficulty. You can't really know unless you test over and over and over, but people are given a card, you see which shapes to use based on the die roll, and then you race to fill your card in order to score points in various ways, depending on which edition of Ubongo you have. And you have the advanced version where now you're placing four shapes instead of three. So there's a different skill to this. It's not just seeing the challenge, but can you actually put things together? So it draws on different skills, often a spatial recognition skill, and people vary in terms of their ability on this. Well, Jigos Reitzman has a new game along the similar lines called Tuki by Next Move Games. And the Next Move line, it's a series of themed abstract games. So Tuki or Tukalik, uh, as I understand it, is representing something in the Inuit language that has significance. Particularly, you're looking at these rock structures or Inuksuk that people build uh, that are used, as I understand it, to convey communication on a tundra landscape that typically has very few landmarks. So you're going to look off in the distance and you see some structure and that structure is conveying some sort of information to you. Uh, you know, go here for caribou or don't walk this way before ice or a restroom to the left or whatever. I don't no, the rule book has a brief introduction by chance at my son's international night. Uh, one of the classrooms had built a nookshook on the wall of the school. So interesting, uh, plural in nook suit. There's all sorts of things. You, you learn all these different things in a superficial way. So you are building something with stones and that's generally all you need to know. You don't need to know the background of an Uxuk. It's just sort of interesting and you can look into it as you want and you can read up on the history of that and see that it has very little relation to what you are doing in the game, but it provides a little thematic atmosphere to the basic building activity. What is that? Here are most of the components in Tuki, which is a two to four player game, yet the game contains three sets of building pieces, not four. I'll explain how that works in a moment. The gist of the game is that you lay all the pieces out in front of you. These blocks represent snow, and the snow is not important. The snow is sort of the extra bit that you use to create the actual structure of meaning. And how you get that structure of meaning is you roll a die. It is either going to show a fish or a polar bear or a bird, and that determines which side of this card goes down and that determines how you want to orient these colored pieces. So we roll, I get a bird with a white dot underneath it. So not only do I have to build in this shape with these blocks, uh, vertically of course, ending up in this pattern, but I must have snow on the ground. I can't just put a colored block onto the fabric. So I do something along these lines, I need this one three up. So here, nope, not big enough. So 
here. Now this one. Mm -hmm. There we go. So we have this shape. And as soon as you're done, you say done. And if you were the last player done, then you get the card and that's bad. The loser places the card in front of them and in a two and three player game, you continue. You roll the die, you look at the new card, you see which orientation it goes in and then you continue. And you keep playing multiple rounds until one player has five cards. And in a two player game, that player just loses. They are clearly the slowest player, you're done. The other person wins. In a three player game, that player with five cards is out and serves as judge for the remaining two people who have a runoff. And whichever player is fastest in that runoff wins the game. So even if someone is close to elimination, as long as they don't go over that five card threshold, they still have a chance to win. And it's similar in the four player game, which works a little differently because there are only three sets of pieces. So three players start, whoever gets the card is out for the next round. They pass their pieces to the player who doesn't have them. And then those three players play. I and mean, you can serve as judge watching to see who is last. That player gets a card and passes their pieces. So it works out a bit more fairly in that the same player can't lose two turns in a row. There will be multiple rounds of the game. And so it gives people a little more fighting chance unless of course they're terrible, in which case they're just gonna lose every other round and be out of the game anyway. A four player game works similar to the three player game. Once someone has five cards, they are out. The other three, three people each take a set of building pieces and whoever is fastest wins. So again, you have a chance to come back from almost being eliminated to victory, which I have seen happen I've played five times on a review copy from Next Move Games, twice with four people, three times with two people, and it's very different experience between the two and four player game. Again, just because with a two player game, it's me against you, and if I'm faster than you in general, in recognizing what needs to be done and doing it just a little bit faster all the time, then I will just run away with it generally, maybe, possibly. But with a four player game, you get a lot more variety of experience, not just because you're passing the pieces around and the person who's losing is going to be different each round. You just get more competition and it's more interesting to see the variety of structures that people build because the snow blocks can be in any orientation. They don't have to line up. They don't have to be on the ground. You don't have to use all of them. Uh, people use them for counterweights, so you're building these structures with things high up, and then the snow can be used to balance so something stays stable. And it's interesting to watch the variety of builds that people have, how they are approaching this problem. Where in a two-player game, it's pretty much just, I am, I'm head down on myself, and that's it. And then I might not even see what you build, because if I say done, and you're just like, and knock your stuff over. Uh, I've, that has been a lot of my experience. Uh, people just want to build. I, I played one game with my son and he just wanted to build things. He wanted some rule other than a race to determine victory, which is hard, such as he, he wanted to use whichever player uses the fewest pieces, which is hard as well because you only have four snow pieces. So typically you're going to be doing roughly the same things, but not necessarily. There's sort of an optimal solution if you wanna figure out what's the fewest number of pieces you can use to create something. I don't know if that's good or not. Then it's sort of a, a you know, one of the, the game show challenges where I, I say done with two, and now you have to figure out how to do it with only one piece, if possible. You know, that's one way you can approach it. That's not the game in the box. With four people though, Sometimes you have a round where you sit out and you're just watching other people. Or if you're quick, you finish early and then you can watch other people do things. Or of course, you're just racing, trying not to lose the round. So there's a wider variety of experience with the four player game. And then beyond that, you also have the advanced game. With the advanced game, you give a yellow stone to each player and you have a different set of building cards. So again, you roll the die, you see whether you're gonna do fish, polar bear, or bird, on top of snow or with the pieces being able to be placed on the ground directly. 
So you roll bird on the snow, pull out the card, orient it so you can see what you're trying to do. Uh, and then of course you're trying to do it upside down on camera, which is gonna be a bit more difficult, but we can make it happen. With the camera at a slight angle, you can hold things as you wish as you're building. Piece of cake, done. Let's move that more in the camera. Let's take it for a victory lap. Yes. Wave to the crowds. Anyone who's played one of the Jigal Strikeman games will probably expect an advanced level. That's what you do in all the Ubongo games, and it provides a variety of play, possibly as a leveling ground. So people who are more advanced can go for the harder side and people who are not can go for the easier side. And it roughly balances, of course, depending on the skill of the people. It's hard to balance that exactly because what does adding another block mean in terms of your comprehension and your building ability and the time involved? And uh, you can try to balance these things as you will. What was interesting though is I played in uh, two floor player games, once with the basic and then once advanced, and it didn't really change how well people did. We all sort of share things back and forth. Uh, some people having less experience or less building ability, I'm not sure, but I played a lot of these games and I'm usually pretty good at dissecting what needs to be done and then figuring out how to work from there. What was really interesting though was playing a two player game of the basic version where I taught it to someone, a friend of mine, uh, and he lost five rounds straight. So I had played before, I had experience. I know these types of games. I was just teaching them and he played a couple sample rounds and we just went for it. And then we brought out the advanced game and he won the first two. And then we traded back and forth and then he ultimately won the game. And so, I sort of reached this level of, of comprehension or ability where I topped out and then suddenly he had an edge or at least we sort of matched. He started slow and then caught up at the end. I don't know exactly how to describe it. It'd be interesting to look at this in a more advanced way. And I've been meaning to do something about real-time games, again, because I love the genre but they also seem like they have issues where often if one person is slightly faster than others, that person will just win everything because being slightly faster is often enough to get you 100% victory, yeah, roughly speaking. But as you add more complications to a game, things change. And I noticed this in another uh, real-time game, uh, Me Want Cookies, I remember correctly from Scorpion Masque, where you're turning over cards and you're following lines. So you have this series of tangled lines where an ice cream starts and you go through the line and you see what it touches. Maybe it touches the cookie. And then you have another card where you start with the cookie now and go from there. And you see it goes to the cake. And you follow from the third card to see the object that you're supposed to grab from the table. And we played it with three cards and I would win consistently. And then we added a fourth card and this other person started winning consistently. And so it was, it was interesting to see the sort of topping out of people's mental abilities. I couldn't handle apparently more than three cards. I don't know what that was. Why couldn't I just carry on to the next one? And yet this other person couldn't do it at three and yet could do it at four. It's an interesting, weird ability. And it's, it's part of why I, part of why I enjoy games is just watching people's abilities in different ways and different skills, and you're comparing them in this completely artificial environment, where I don't know if it has any practical applications to anything, except it's just seeing what people can do when confronted with problems in unfamiliar situations, and that's. That's what I enjoy lots of times is seeing this. And the real-time game gives you this experience in a very quick way, and yet sometimes it's a very unsatisfying way if you're just winning consistently. So it's hard for me to play spot it with anyone because I'm usually pretty good. And then people uh, learn that you are good at such things and they're just like, yeah, we don't wanna play those types of games with you. 
So maybe need a special real-time game group where we only sit around and focus on those particular types of games. So again, if we get that, is it just going to be one person is slightly better and they win? Something to explore in the future. As for Tuki, it provides a little different experience because, of course, you have to figure out you know, what you're looking at. Can you parse it? Can you determine what you actually need to do? And then how are you going to make that happen? Where's the balancing point in that structure? Is there one balancing point? Can you approach it multiple ways? Do you have the right snow pieces that you can create a structure that you might visualize? So it's providing more challenges than just looking at something and pointing. You're gonna build on from there and race and compete. And the four player game was far more satisfying because you had, again, the, the variety of experience in terms of watching and then sitting out and seeing others and seeing the builds as opposed to just me versus you, pedal to the metal, done. That's it. The games lasted a lot longer too because, of course, with more people, generally the losses were spread out more and provided a more satisfying experience, a, a more, you know, uh, a more grounded story, if you want, to how the game played out, instead of just the volley of tennis, where I lost, I lost, you lost, I lost. Uh, there's a little bit more around the table and watching other people, the satisfaction that comes with that. There you go, overview of Tuki.